so a very good afternoon good morning and hello to dear participants to everyone hello hello can you hear me yes yes we can hear you thank yes, you yes yes so nice nice to meet you Esra and ben nice to meet you so <laughs> i welcome you on behalf of jindal global university that today we are here on this session number 17 and we are having this five day virtual world university summit on universities of the future that is building institutional resilience social responsibility and community impact in g20 countries so this is the conference this is the theme that is going on from from this uh, monday onwards the five day theme and uh, this particular summit is organized by general global center for g20 studies and international institute for higher education research and capacity building within OP Jindal University. So this was the background that I was trying to make. And we are having this session. Uh, the theme is beyond brick and mortar, quality assurance, accreditation, and benchmarking. So this is very, very relevant uh, in this particular uh, context of academia that we are looking for this quality, accreditation, and benchmarking as per our respective universities, academic institutions. So. On behalf of the campus, on behalf of the university, myself is Professor Sachin Kumar Mangla, and I would like to welcome our speakers, our panelists of the day, Essa and Ben. So as per instructions received, let me brief first of all, what we are going to do. So this is a 60 minute session. And first of all, I will be introducing uh, our panelists and then I will be giving every brief introductory marks, remarks on the theme of the panel of the session that we are going to address. And then let's say I will invite our experts, Ben and Esra, just for a very brief remarks on the theme. And then there will be some questions that I'm going to ask, that I'm going to take their views. Okay. And then at the end, uh, we are going to take maybe a very few questions from the audience if they have any doubts or queries or maybe if you would like to comment something so we are going to compress the whole knowledge session within one hour so i hope it is clear now let me first of all provide an introduction to our speaker to the to the panelist member and today in that i have two guests again ben and Esra. So, first of all, Mr. I would like to uh, introduce Mr. Ben. So, Mr. Ben Swarter is the Senior Vice President, Institutional Performance at QS. He has led the team behind the QS World Ranking for over a decade. He leads the QS Intelligence Unit, a global team that has developed into a world-leading think tank on the measurement and management of performance in universities. This team has also provides distinctive business intelligence to over 200 client institutions worldwide and operate two major international conferences every year. He has been invited to hundreds of universities in over 30 countries where he has spoken about the research work carried out by his team. Mr. Swarter is an authority on comparative performance in international higher education. He is also a board member of QS, Simon Limited since 2015. So I will welcome Mr. Ben Sauter on the behalf of the campus, on the behalf of institution. Thanks for joining. Now the next panelist, Professor Dr. Esra Hattipagu. Dr. Hattipalu completed her PhD in the field of European studies in English from 1994 to 2001 at the European Community Institute of Marmara University. While continuing her doctoral studies at Marmara University, Hati Palu was accepted <clears throat> by the London School of Economics from 1995 to 1996 and completed her second master's degree in the field of Russian and post-Soviet studies. She has done her academic studies on Russia, Central Asia, and the European Union in general. Dr. Hetty Paolo started her academic career as a research assistant while doing her master's degree at Marmara University. She continued her academic career by entitling the title of professor 
in 2014 she has also she has also held various admin positions at marmara university in 2016 she was appointed as the rector of nastasi university in 2020 she has started to work at bajesia university as an advisor to the rector in charge of international cooperation hatipalu has been working as the director of bajesia university almer school of government and leadership since 2021 and has been appointed as the bau global chancellor as of january 2023 so on these words i will welcome esra now we also have our another speaker our another panelist who has recently joined professor dr beshki sipo twala so dr twala is deputy vice chancellor digital transformation twasane university of technology south africa he is a prolific researcher with over 20 years of experience in putting mathematics to scientific use in the form of data comparison inference analysis and presentation to design collect and interpret data experiments surrounding the fields of transport medical artificial intelligence software engineering robotics and most recently in electrical and electronics engineering at tut in his current role he is responsible for leading the university's continuing digital transformation agenda so i will welcome twala as well and these were our panelists so thanks for joining for for this afternoon now let me give a concept note to introduce the theme so the theme is beyond brick and mortar quality assurance accreditation and benchmarking so i think uh, academic institutions like we all are looking for quality we are looking for accreditations and we all are looking for this benchmarking so it is the heart of every university to build a sound quality assurance infrastructure which includes focus on the design of academic and admin systems benchmarked against international norms and standards with strong stakeholder feedback systems as universities strive to be globally relevant and role models for institutional excellence so it becomes important that to measure up to global quality and standards of excellence therefore universities they must pro promote a globally diverse perspective through faculty courses and programs they must adopt adaptive benchmarking practices which is very important and which should meet internationally recognized standards a key feature of achieving institutional credibility is to be accredited by different national and international accreditation agencies this plays a significant role in enhancing confidence in the institution and that is very important and need of the hour as well educator richard prin in one of his articles mentions that often while using the term standards in students learning outcome we fail to ask this question like what do you mean so often we we fail to ask this question but it is very important similarly we need to stop and reflect on what benchmarking and accreditation really means because this is something that is it is very important this is just not important for the university but it is also very very important for other stakeholders like uh, like students and faculty and maybe other policy makers as well accreditation processes are important for having a competitive edge because we as an institution we need those academic accreditations but we should be mindful that it doesn't take away our focus from the quality of education being imparted because accreditation we need but we should not compromise with the quality in this context the panel will deliberate on the various facets of university level accreditations ranking and benchmarking so this was something that was a very formal introduction for the theme and what we are expecting from the panelist and what we are probably discussing for our audience so this was something that i have provided now probably i will invite maybe our panelist just for a very brief remarks maybe very brief remarks maybe one by one on the theme so maybe i can first invite ben for his views 
Uh, thank you very much, Professor Sachin. It's a pleasure to be here today, and congratulations to JGU for pulling together such a spectacular virtual event again. Um, it's it's good to be here to discuss some of these things. Um, I, I would like to zoom out a little bit. Um, you know, I have been running the world's most popular university ranking for 20 years this summer. We're about to release our 20th edition. Oh. Uh, the QS rankings have become very influential. A, a lot of institutions are adjusting their behavior accordingly, uh, mostly positively, sometimes not necessarily quite so positively. Uh, and the same is true of, of many accreditations and benchmarks. Now, obviously, accreditations and benchmarks have their place. But there's a danger uh, of two things happening. Firstly, there's a danger that we propagate a race to the middle, um, or even a race to the minimum in some cases. And I'll come back and talk about that uh, in a moment. And the other is that there's a danger that we flip the sort of slave master relationship. And the reality is that rankings and accreditations and benchmarks should be led by the sector should be led by institutions. All too often, institutions allowing themselves to be led by the benchmarks or the accreditations of, uh, and the rankings. And that's not what we set out to do uh, back in 2004 when we began the rankings. It's not what all of the accreditations uh, set out to do. Now, talking about that sort of race to the middle or race to the minimum scenario, the uh, here's a good example, right? So pretty much every country in the world, um, some under more duress than others, have set themselves a net zero uh, target uh, for, for carbon neutrality. Um, India, 2070. And, and there are a variety of reasons why India's uh, target is a little bit later than other countries. It's got a, a bit of a, a bigger situation to deal with, and I understand that. But like institutions in many other countries, many of the institutions in India have by default set their own net zero target to 2070. But universities are where the science exists. Universities is where the enlightenment exists. Universities are not industrial organizations with a, a lot of, of emissions to, to offset. Uh, it's not as expensive for universities to get to net zero as it is for many other organizations of equivalent size. So if the country is going to achieve its target, universities need to get there 10 years, 20 years, 30 years before the country as a whole does. It's an example of everybody saying, OK, we can relax now. There's a benchmark and therefore we don't necessarily need to move as quickly. Another story I'll tell before I hand over to everybody else, because I'm really keen to get into the questions and the conversation. That's the good stuff. So I was recently at a couple of events, one in India um, and one in the Middle East that, that, that we ran, summits with groups of influencers from across the sector in those, in those cases. Um, in India, I met somebody from, from the UK, actually, from a leading university in the UK, who said that they're trying to evolve their courses. They're trying to innovate. They're trying to use new technology in the classroom. And one of the biggest blockers to them being able to do that is the professional bodies who accredit their courses, who are too traditional, too fixed in their ways and won't allow the university to continue to innovate and still bestow their accreditation. In the Middle East, I met an institution who was putting themselves through one of the US regional accreditation standards. And in order to do that, they'd been instructed that they could do nothing new for five years, five years, no new courses, no new offerings, no changes to your existing curriculum. You have to freeze in time for five years. Now in 2023, five years is a very, very, very long time. And when we look at what universities have got to do, what the, the, the values and the character we need them to do a better job of bestowing in future leaders, the skills development that they need to develop in the future workforce and the problems in the world that they need to contribute to the research of, there is no time for any institution to wait five years 
just because an accrediting body tells them to. So I think there's a real danger, and I'd like to get into this, there's a real danger that much as benchmarks and accreditations and rankings are seen as a driver of quality, and in many cases they are, in just as many cases, they're an excuse not to move. They're an excuse not to change. They're an excuse not to fulfill our complete potential. And whilst they eliminate the worst, they also constrain the best. Wonderful, wonderful, Ben. And I really appreciate your thoughts on this benchmark ranking and accreditation by examples given by you. So uh, without any further delay, I will move to uh, our next panelist. So maybe Twala? That's fine. That's, uh, that's okay. Th th thank you very much. I mean, uh, thanks also for, for the invite. Uh, thanks to the other panelists and uh, to all the participants. Uh, I think this is a very kind of like uh, useful uh, discussion. Uh, it's not just about the panelists. It's about having kind of like a conversation. So that by the end of the conference, uh, we could sort of like implement whatever discussions that uh, we go through. Um, my approach in quality assurance is comes from the digital transformation sphere, whereby we have seen in recent years, um, where especially during COVID, where we were to change the game uh, in terms of how students uh, learn uh, uh, and also how stuff they sort of like teach. So the teaching and learning kind of like uh, uh, portfolio had to change because of that. So digital transformation has come into play in it because uh, it all talks about all the technologies that we had uh, or we have, which were there, but now how are we going to utilize them in transforming uh, the education kind of like sector? Uh, for example, in our university, one of the strategic, our strategic pillars is to have future ready sort of like students. In other words, our students, when they complete, are they relevant uh, in industry? Are they relevant globally? So that they could able to sort of like tackle uh, the real world problems that we're faced with, which include quite a number of things, climate change, which include uh, uh, um, food, uh, so that which include uh, uh, health or medical care and other things or finances as well. So that's where we, we start with. So our curricula becomes also important uh, because you can't say students are gonna be future ready, but you don't revisit your curricula. I think uh, our Ben just made a very good point to say uh, he heard that there'll be no change in curriculum for five years. That, I mean, even if uh, it was two years, you're getting a bit worried because of the, the way that technology sort of like changes within a blink of an eye. So your students and also staff, they have to be ready for that. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not even about academic, it's about non-academic as well. Even the staff, they have to be part of the game as well. Uh, as, um, so our investor of technology, especially in Africa, our focus is not just on staff, it's about, it's on students as well. It's also on senior management as well. Who are the ones who come up with all this decision-making kind of like policies? So accreditation has also become important for us. We believe that accreditation should be more kind of like adaptive. Uh, during COVID, our accreditation was done off campus. So now we've developed systems whereby even if uh, there's ISIS, whereby uh, the visits are, are sort of like off campus, we can able to deal with that. So that's where the digital transformation has come up into play as well. And also uh, in terms of um, the adaptation of quality, sort of like assurance for us, has become so far more, more kind of like critical in, 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 in terms of that. So there is need as well for, for multi-stakeholder perspective and kind of like a multi-level approach in quality assurance. Uh, of course, each and every continent is, has got its own standards and guidelines and considerations. For example, digital learning, e-learning, whereby it provides a framework for quality assurance. So those are the things that much as we approach this digital transformation wise, we still follow the guidelines of our continent or the South African kind of like contents as well. And also the benchmarking 
uh, e-excellence benchmarking instrument uh, has been able to provide tools for quality benchmarking and manual with guidelines for improvement. So that has helped us a lot as well. And also the model that we are currently developing will be able to assess mature decision making because what we have done in the continent now, all our decisions are data driven. So the issue of data has become key in whatever we do, whether it's quality assurance, whether it's impactful research, whether it's teaching and learning with technology, whether it's having a digital advanced university. Data has been the core. That's the thing that we're driving. We've, now we've come up with strategies, like for example, data governance strategies, whereby they didn't exist before. But if we, we want to forget about gut, uh, taking gut feeling decisions, we need to readdress the issue of data, whereby all the decisions that you'll be making will be sort of like uh, make a contribution. Also peer review. I mean, it's very important for us because it has contributed a lot in our quality before even a course is started, uh, whereby we engage uh, with industry, we engage with um, stakeholders as well to see whether our programs uh, can contribute uh, to the quality of our education system. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, as a high institution universities, we should be able to adopt sort of like an education cycle parallel to the research track in which the best course and program designs are shared and published. So in a nutshell, that's what uh, I believe that uh, is the way forward. It's not just in the context of South Africa or Africa. I think even other universities have been in the first world, that's how they've been approaching this. Of course, we benchmark with the, those universities, because as Africa, you know, that we have lagged behind in terms of uh, infrastructure, in terms of uh, funding as well, we've sort of like been battling. But I always say that it's better to start small and grow rather than to try and do so many things and be able and struggle in the long run. So that's my take on, on, the, on the quality assurance that it's high time we utilize the technologies that we have in order to transform uh, the higher education institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Twala. Thanks for your, for your remarks because on this digital transformation and this data driven. So these are the future. Now I will move to, to our next panel. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Esra, please. Yeah, thank you. Please. Thank you. I am very happy to be here. Uh, and uh, let me first uh, say that this is the most uh, organized organization I have ever seen until now. So thank you very much for all your efforts and thank I, you. Uh, I cannot remember how many emails I got from you uh, in the organization. So thank you very much for all these, uh, just thinking all the details of the of everything. So thank you very much. This is also a sign how we are doing the things in uh, those days, in these days. So related with the uh, topic, I also look at the situation or, or the, the topic from uh, education point of view and changing nature of education. Which, is, which have already started even before COVID-19, but after COVID-19, uh, we really saw lots of changes in, the, in many aspects of the education, including the instruction, attendance, testing, funding, role of technology. So these were very important things that affects also accreditation, quality assurance, and everything, because we are talking about now dynamic situation, and everything is changing so quickly and all these rules and rankings and everything has to adopt the new the changing situation in uh, some aspect. Um, it's not only the change, uh, because change uh, starts with the change of minds, which is very important in uh, many senses. Uh, it's the change of mind of the leadership leaders, the change of mind of students, change of mind of instructors, and it's not only change of minds, uh, but also digital infrastructure. Also reskilling is uh, always needed and learning preferences of students as uh, Tuala said, uh, change is, uh, are also uh, changing all the time. We are talking about artificial intelligence, uh, internet of things, et cetera, et cetera. So everything is changing and we, even started to talk about all these uh, whilst uh, discussing education for zero. 
and we focus ourselves on learning anytime, anywhere. Remote, self-paced learning, student-centered learning, individualized education. So we are or personalized education uh, or project-based education. And when I see all these counting of research uh, articles and everything starting, uh, I mean, concerning with these uh, evaluation processes of accreditations and uh, benchmarking quality assurance, I think we should also rethink about the methods of uh, assessments of the universities or any educational institutions uh, in this sense. Definitely, we all believe that uh, accreditation and rankings are tools to improve the quality of education. Definitely, this is for sure. But it should not be uh, only just checking of the boxes, right? Okay, we did this, we did this, we did this, and now we are uh, we have the best quality. So uh, it's, they are necessary for self-reflection, for improvement, and just to understand the position of your institutions within the world educational system, this is for sure. Uh, and it also gives you some continuous improvement culture. I mean, culture of continuous improvement. This is, uh, again, very important because if you are in the process of accreditation, then you really try hard just to improve yourself. Uh, and just to uh, somehow organize yourself, because in many universities, it's not, you are doing so many things, but you cannot just prove it. Uh, so accreditation processes just uh, help you in organizing all the things that you are doing, just to appreciate yourself from one side, because you are doing, and you never realize that you are doing that much of things. So this is also very important for self-assurance as well. And also, uh, it's very important to get the feedback and just to re uh, somehow reveal yourself, assess your program, uh, trying to uh, stick on more effective teaching methods, tools. And from the other side, it also gives some motivation for everyone within the university, from leadership to the students. It gives some motivation. Uh, just to uh, reach these uh, excellence uh, points. And it's really pressured them just to, to do much better in many senses, to do in a much organized way. And also from our point of view, uh, if we are talking about uh, Tur Turkey's position within this system, it's also important for our students, families, parents, employers, um, as a uh, valuable uh, information. If your university is accredited or if your university is high in the rankings, then it means something for the students, for the employers, for the parents. So it gives some confidence to them so that they can really uh, understand that the institutions definitely meet some certain standards and offers a quality of education because this is one of the signs that uh, you are having that kind of um, education. Definitely, I mean, it also gives some improvement and motivation for everyone, um, every partners within the system. But at the same time, I mean, we cannot say that every, I mean, none of the system is perfect. So there are lots of critics about rankings, accreditation systems, and uh, they are being biased or you know having some uh, standards, and uh, they are focused more on the quantitative uh, nature, etc. But anyway, all these critics never really make them something which uh, has to be uh, uh, abolished or something like this. So this is very important. We believe in that, but uh, it should be much more a holistic approach in general, just to include everything, because self-assessment is important, but a third party's inclusion in the system is something else. So it's necessary. Uh, it has some, uh, I don't want to say deficiencies, but it has, some, uh, we may criticize it in uh, from, various points of views, but this uh, doesn't 
mean that they are useless. So definitely they are useful and uh, they are necessary. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for your lovely remarks. And uh, I'm, I, must, I must say that it is going to be very exciting because the introduction of the remark that have been presented by our, by our panelists. So I'm going to go with the first question of discussion or the first point that we are going to discuss because I have a couple of points to discuss and I will pass on uh, each point to, to our panelists one by one. So the first point is, how can accreditation and ranking be more than just a compliance measure? How can it actually improve quality of education? I think uh, in the introductory remarks, already something has been covered on this particular aspect, but still I will, I will pass on this question one by one to our panel for their, for their invaluable insights. So maybe Ben, first of all, you can take. Okay, um, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think first and foremost, the key driver of quality in education is the focus leadership of the institution. And you know, in an ideal world, accreditations and rankings performance are, are a byproduct of that drive to excellence rather than, rather than a driver of it. Um, rankings in particular tend to fail almost entirely to evaluate the quality of teaching specifically. It's just not, a workable paradigm you know how do you sit how, how do you sit in every class you know maybe in in, in a few years time um, ai will be able to sit in every online class and give you a, a sense of how good the teaching is um, but we're not quite we're not quite there yet um, and they can't sit in an offline class i think we're, we're a few decades away from uh, from from that possibility um so in but but obviously what's happening in the classroom is only one part of the educational experience. Uh, the quality of the facilities, the qualifications of the faculty, the uh, availability of laboratory equipment, uh, the, uh, the well being of the students, uh, the diversity of the students, the, you know, the, the social, social and environmental sustainability of the campus. These are all things that, that influence the, amongst others, that influence the educational experience and that are a little bit easier to measure. Um, so in a, in a rankings context, we are, are looking at a lot of environmental factors, a, a lot of things around the educational experience that enrich it, but are not necessarily measuring it directly. I think that's helpful and, and I really enjoyed um, Ezra's perspective. We, um, we often launch our presentations with a quote from the American statistician George Box. Uh, essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, and, you know, I think that's true of, of pretty much all accreditations and rankings that you can bring a combination of them together to be valuable and useful, depending on what your individual institutional priorities are. Um, and layer on top of that, your own character, your own drive, your own values and your own um, higher, higher objectives. The accreditation space is an interesting companion to that, because typically in many accreditations, there is a site visit. Um, there tends to be a lot more qualitative input with professors from other institutions, either, from, uh, either other institutions in the country at a national accreditation level or from other countries in an international accrediting body. And they can sit in on a class. They can examine the curriculum of a particular program. They can look at it uh, in a little bit more depth and, and detail. Um, so, you know, that brings a certain dimension of value that can drive the quality of education up to a point. But the, the difference between a ranking and accreditation is that a ranking uh, tends to get you looking at the best in a domain. It ten, tends to get you looking at the top of the table. In the global context, it gets you looking at MIT. In the Indian context, it gets you looking at IISC or, or the IITs or, or Delhi University or the leading private institutions, if, that, if that's more uh, relevant to your, your benchmark perspective. An accreditation tends to make you look at a standard that is at this level. And, and it's a lot of work for some institutions to get to that standard. So they work sometimes for years to get to that standard. And when they get to that standard, there's this big sigh of relief. They're like, oh, 
Okay. Now we're as good as those hundreds of other institutions. We can relax. Um, you know, we just need to sustain it now. Uh, and that's where I say no. You know, that's where maybe the ranking potentially kicks in. You get to the accreditation level and then you see, no, let's keep going further. Let's keep understanding what our own ambitions are and how we can drive uh, standards to new heights, how we can help redefine the standards uh, rather than simply meeting them. Great, great. So I will pass on it to Twala. I think for me, the accreditation and uh, or ranking, sorry, in as much as it's important, but uh, we, we have tended to focus on rankings rather than uh, transferring of knowledge and skills to students. Uh, because rankings mainly they focus on research. I'm not saying that teaching and learning does play doesn't play a key role. It does, but mainly it's research. So most universities what they've done now, they've, their focus is now on research outputs, uh, and as a result, that has impacted uh, the teaching and learning side of things, which is why we are called universities. That should be the drive rather than, of course, research is important. You want to do. To, to, to help to, to you want research to have an impact. But for me, that's, that's why uh, I've always been worried about rankings. Uh, they are very good. I mean, it shows how you have gone, I mean, as a university. But at the same time, it shouldn't be something that, uh, uh, as uh, one of our uh, the panelists, as I said, the ticking of boxes. I always say some of the things, they should come natural. It's like when you're applying to be a professor, and you just want to meet the minimum requirement. That, to me, that's the that, that's what worries me. It will be just someone has proven himself, he's produced, he's supervised students, he's teaching well, he's attracted funding. And when he applies, it comes natural. I mean, he qualifies without shade of doubt. But if you start now figuring out just how do I reach a 75% mark to be a professor, that becomes a problem. Same with rankings. University should still have strategies of uh, impactful research, uh, strategies of having future ready graduates, uh, uh, strategies of uh, um, resource allocation, optimization of resources and stuff like that, uh, strategies of uh, digital advanced university. It should come natural, the strategies are there. At the end of the, or after a couple of years, then the university should show where they stand, where they've achieved that in terms of the strategies that they came up with. But I've got nothing against rankings, uh, but it's just that other universities, they, they are sort of like obsessed with the rankings, uh, such that um, you'll hear a colleague saying, or a, uh, a colleague saying, oh, I don't believe that we are, we are faith yet. I thought we were number 10. So, but when they are put in number 10, they query that, no man, I think we're good enough, we should have been at five, because that's where the game is now rather than things coming natural. Of course, you are great if you are ranked high, but at the same time, we should continue sort of like doing things natural. And at the end of the day, you'll be surprised after five, the amount of work that you would have achieved. Yeah. But, so that's my, my take on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Twala, for your take that you mentioned about uh, that teaching and learning is also very important apart from research. So I will give uh, now next question to Esra because otherwise we'll be having shortage of time. This is more on online learning. So the next point is uh, where I would like to take the opinion of Esra. Like as online learning begins to become more than just a temporary response. So what criteria do you think will be most important to measure this quality of uh, online learning system? Because uh, now these days we are talking about digital transformation and all these things. And in this, arena of this open, uh, you could say open AI, while engaging with the students online, we will need robust mechanisms. So what do you think, like how we can ensure a balance between quality regulations and autonomy and maybe pedagogy, so maybe creativity. So what is your take on, on this? Yeah. Please. Uh, 
Yes, online learning is not only a part of education anymore, but a necessity. I mean, just this is very important. That's why we have to refigure how we will just uh, measure the quality of online learning. Uh, I mean, I can just pinpoint some of the uh, points that I want to emphasize uh, to be as short as possible because we are, we are running out of time. Um, definitely, many uh, as many in uh, in conservative. Uh, I mean, the other types of educations, learning outcomes are the most important thing, and it's, uh, definitely uh, even in online uh, learning, the learning outcomes should be defined uh, very clearly and measurable. This is one of the most important thing. The second thing is students should get the maximum support. Uh, and uh, the assessment can be done uh, over this uh, criteria. Students should get adequate uh, support services, academic advising, counseling, technical support, everything. So this is the, uh, the online learning can be assessed through this. The other thing is about the instructors. I mean, the instructors uh, ha has to reskill themselves and have a different types of uh, maybe uh, approaches like student-centered. They have to try to get students engaged, interactive. They may uh, want to use much more multimedia so, uh, sources, interactive assessments, et cetera, et cetera. So instructors' uh, assessment should be done over uh, these uh, criteria. Another thing about faculty support, which is also important uh, because Faculties uh, are also have to have adequate training. Um, they have to improve their skills, and they have to teach. Uh, they have to, uh, I mean, to adapt themselves to teach uh, more effectively through uh, online uh, learning. And definitely, the technology. Technology is one of the most important criteria here. I think, uh, which is reliable technology should be reliable accessible and easy to use uh, this is the most important thing i think because uh, of the uh, um, accessibility and there should be a uh, technology that will ease the communication between the instructor and the students so there should be a collaborative or cooperative approach uh, among the uh, among all these uh, parties so that they can communicate because there should be some sort of regular uh, regular um, evaluations, but we should also change the methods of uh, evaluations about the online learning. And we, uh, I mean, the institutions should definitely uh, design the, uh, I mean, design the curriculum uh, the way the, they will give the lectures. But regulatory bodies are also necessary for. Uh, seeing the effectiveness of the online learning. Thank you very much. Great, great. So point to be noted for online learning. So it's more on technical support, student support, on instructor or maybe faculty support, tech collabor collaboration or maybe the kind of, uh, you could say, engagement that we are giving to the students. So that's very important. So let me move to the next point. So the next point is like, uh, already I think this has been discussed, like when, because most of the time institutions they are assessing their benchmarking as per the quantitative criteria. Already our experts have discussed about that, maybe the kind of number of research articles published, faculty count, or maybe international collaborations. So this is something like uh, we have already discussed, but still like uh, uh, I think quality is very important. So the quantity that's maybe it's not so important, but still for accreditation, I think we need quantity as well. So already Mr. Twala has mentioned about the importance of this quality that it should not only be the quantity but the quality is also very important and we should not compromise it yeah so the next point i would like to discuss so by being of those uh, let's say arguments on quality and quantity so what role these national and global ranking agencies they are going to play in quality assurance and benchmarking and what are the probably some of the innovations in the assessment of institutions that we can take into consideration probably the online format or maybe the offline format of the education so I can float it to maybe to Mr. Ben. Is it? Thank you. Um, I guess there are, there are different dimensions to this. You know, you know firstly, and, and maybe I can link from the last question. You know, some of the aspects with online learning are quite 
obvious. You know, we can improve the, the quality of provision, the quality of technology. One of the things I don't think that universities are looking at enough in an online learning context is what happens in a campus experience scenario outside the classroom. And what about the, you know, when I'm an employer, I'm looking for people who've engaged in sporting activities, who've engaged in student societies and activities like that, who've, who've found a cause, who've met new people, who've done, who've gone through a, a number of experiential moments during their, during, during their course um, that they don't necessarily get from an online environment. But, you know, what if they could? And when you move that into thinking about quality and the role of rankings and accreditations, you recognize uh, one brutally obvious truth, which is that, that we cannot be the ultimate driver of innovation and quality. You know, an accreditation has to embrace all of its target institutions. It drives, if anything, a degree of homogenization rather than a degree of distinctiveness and, and excellence beyond, beyond that standard. A ranking by the same measure, it has to draw on data that it can pick up for all of the institutions it ranks. Uh, and it can't say that institution is fantastic as this, uh, at this and that institution is fantastic at this. So let's put those together and decide which is more important. It, it has to simplify the templates and, and therefore the message to institutional leaders is use the rankings by all means, use the accreditations, but define what success looks like for yourself and be ambitious and go far beyond that which the, that which the, the standards suggest. That being said, we have noticed, and thank you for calling this out, um, Professor Twala, uh, that in some cases there's a bit of an obsession with rankings uh, and for some institutions, unfortunately too many institutions, um, they're inclined to follow us rather than lead us. Um, I encourage all institutions to lead us rather than follow us, but for those who are following us, we are gonna continue to make innovations. That's why we're placing a stronger emphasis on employability and skills in the next edition of the World University Rankings. That's why we're introducing a stronger measure of international collaboration uh, and that's why we are introducing into our main rankings, not as a sideshow, not as a separate thing, but into our main rankings, a metric to focus institutions on sustainability. Because for all of those institutions who lack the courage to lead, well, we're gonna give you some important things to follow uh, uh, as, as, a, as a thin substitute. Um, but what really excites us is the institutions that go so far beyond our imaginings and do incredible things and really think about their students and their communities and the impact that they set forth and were established in the first place to create. Wonderful. So thanks for your thought about this. Don't follow and please lead. So uh, I will also advise to all leaders that probably we need to lead without following them. So taking it further, uh, I would like to pass on uh, the next question, the next aspect to Professor Twala, that we are talking about innovative methodologies and we are talking about probably what universities can do, but how about these quality, other quality assurance standards, for example, students' feedback forms, because they provide crucial feedback from the student perspective that what they are looking for, or probably what is their perspective uh, for the institution or probably for that quality or maybe for the standards they are expecting. So, so please, please, could you throw a light on this aspect about uh, how crucial is the student feedback forms and probably what institutions they can probably learn or they can do better on that particular aspect. So please. Ex excellent, excellent question uh, for discussion. The, the, the issue with uh, feedback from students is critical. It shouldn't start when you're on the ropes. What, what do I mean by that? Uh, already you've come up with a strategy. Uh, it's already in motion. And then a student is stuck and it doesn't know what to do. When we develop the strategies, we should always engage with students and staff and stakeholders. For example, uh, our digital transformation strategy, after we've crafted it, we send it to students of course, a sample, we couldn't take it to all the students. We sent it to staff, 
we send it to stakeholders for comments so that they are involved and they're part of it. Same with, uh, with uh, quality assurance and assessment. When you develop all these quality assurance strategies, make sure you involve students as you develop the strategies. Don't develop a strategy and then ram it on the student's throat because they're not gonna respond. Uh, so that's point number one. The, the other part is analytics. Uh, I call this learning analytics. For me, it's got a big role in, high, in the higher education sector. In terms of, I've already spoken about this, that uh, in terms of being just being data-driven in managing our systems, which allows quite a number of things, gathering of large amounts of data generated by students in order to predict their individual learning outcomes. So they're part of it. The information you 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 you, you gather, you have the same information you use to be able to predict things. So for me, I uh, always go by some steps that were set out by Campbell, I think in 2006 or seven, whereby he said for learning analytics, you need to capture, report, predict, act, and refine. Those five things are very important and students are involved in it. Of course, we still have to use uh, teaching evaluation whereby each and every module, uh, because some of the institutions here they, I think they do it every other two years. For me, it's important that you do your teaching evaluations every year because students differ from time to time. The comments you get from students will differ as well. And the comments you get from students also are critical in terms of improving the program or improving that module and also coming up with new ideas. Of course, uh, the advisory committees, universities that we have, they do play a key role because most of them, they come from industry. Industry, they also play a key role in the development of our programs because they know exactly what's going on. Uh, as a university, we might, uh, there are things that we might overlook, but industry, they, they're, they're in it. They know exactly the, the skills that are in demand uh, and uh, the programs that will help you tell. For example, in South Africa, currently, we were struggling with automobile skills. We've got a lot of motor industries, Ford, uh, BMW, Nisa, but they always tell us that they just can't get students with the, the right skills. So what we've done, now they come on board, they, we craft the modules or the programs together so that they are able to be accommodated along those lines. Because ed students themselves are busy doing other things as well. Even if whatever feedback they give, it will be related to the module and how the instruction is carried out. Uh, so for me, it's important that uh, we, we sort of like bridge that gap to say, okay, uh, let's involve the students uh, from the beginning when you craft your strategies. And also, as you now teach and lend the students with all these new technologies as well. Another aspect that I want to highlight, which is very important, uh, practical experience has become critical in this day and age. One of the days we'll just teach students uh, signal processing, theory, when they leave. Now for me, it's important that as you teach them the signal processing, I'm giving an example because I used to teach signal processing. They also have the practical experience as well, because that's what industry wants. Industry doesn't want all the theories, but how are you gonna be able to accommodate that? It means our labs have to be state of the art. The equipment that we have in labs should be top. So it becomes important that as a university or higher education institution, uh, the students becomes hands-on. They, they're able to experiment with all these things before they even complete. Because once they complete, it's game over. Industry, and uh, in as much as they are prepared to teach students, they've got no time. They, they assume that universities are able to provide those skills in terms of uh, theory and also backing up the theory with implementation. So for me, it's very important that our students, they're hands-on. Um, some of them, they say it in, that, in their evaluation, in the evaluation, teaching evaluation, that they leave without any practical experience. All they do is just to learn theory or they learn about programs that will be irrelevant when they complete. So that's why we, we have to keep on revisiting uh, as to how uh, our curriculum from time to time so that our students, they are part of the game and they are able to enjoy what they do. At the same time, industry benefits as well. Thank you.
Great, great. So thanks for, for your remarks on hands-on teaching evaluation in Australia analytics and probably the more and more participation of the students. So the next question or the next point that we would like to invite uh, Esra for about uh, meaningful collaborations because student learning, student feedback we have, we have understood. So what do you think like about of this meaningful collaborations to exchange the best practices? Because when we are talking about collaboration, so there is also a collaboration between maybe senior or maybe younger universities or institutions. So, so what do you think like uh, how is it going to help uh, different universities. Uh, I will request to be to be a bit short because you okay, have, okay. Yeah, thank you, thank uh, you. First of all, I would like to say that uh, now senior uh, institutions and younger institutions. I mean, uh, it's very difficult just to differentiate between these things in terms of experiences in in the new changing uh, educational system. So uh, some young universities may be much. Uh, easily adapt themselves to the digitalization, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, uh, first of all, we should uh, say this. The second thing, we may have various uh, collaborations methods, but the most important thing, uh, they should be meaningful and they should be implemented. So you may have network building, you may have lots of universities coming together, but if, if it is not working, then uh, it should be working. I mean, this, this collaboration, it should be uh, really uh, taken as something which has to be worked on. Uh, collaborative research or uh, coming together joint research projects are important, PhD students, uh, are very important but, and very crucial in the sense, I think. We have lots of faculty exchange, uh, student exchange programs, some uh, joint degrees, two plus two, four plus one, or designing a, a unique program together with uh, inclusion of the uh, various institutions. Uh, there may be some online learning uh, collaborations plus certificate programs. Uh, if it is possible, there should uh, there can be some uh, funding opportunities from senior universities to younger universities or partnership programs or uh, coming together or uh, related with some workshops and just dealing uh, the transfer of know-how plus there may be some mentorship programs. So there are various methods of having collaboration among universities, but the most important thing uh, if you are signing an MOU, it has uh, to be uh, implemented. Great. You may have hundreds of MOUs, but if it is not working, then there is no, uh, no need to have that amount of MOU. So the numbers, again, uh, is not that matter in this sense. Thank you very much. Great, great. So as you mentioned, number is, is, is just a number, but the implementation or the practical uh, application is very important. So the next aspect is, I would like to ask again, Ben. So how about this culture? Because we have talked about students' feedback forms, digital transformations, or maybe expectations from accreditation bodies. So this culture, like the culture of this internal quality assurance, so how it can be created within academia so that we can promote that excellence and benchmarks. So please. I, I will be requesting you to be very short because we are just having, I think, five to 10 minutes. Yeah. Yes, just a, just a just a couple of minutes. Um, I, I think that in most institutions I visit, the, the culture of quality assurance is 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 emerging in a relatively structured way. You know, most institutions recognise that in, in in order to even get in the game, in, in order to even do the bare minimum, they've got to meet some standard somewhere, and they might select be selective about which standard they pursue. Um, but, you know, more or less, that, that culture is embedded. Um, I think, though, the, the, the problem, the danger, and this is where I started, really, is the perception that that culture is enough, that, that somebody outside is going to tell me what good enough looks like, and when I get there, I'm done. Um, no, nobody outside your institution can tell you what good enough looks like, only your own leadership only your own people can establish what good enough looks like and can craft and drive the culture required to realize that potential and, and the accreditations and the rankings will fall into line along the way 
Um, I'm not quite with Professor Tuala's viewpoint that we should let it be natural. I think you absolutely got to drive hard with fierce ambition. If you, if you let it be natural, a lot of things don't happen. But you've got to decide what the destination looks like and not leave it to us or an accrediting body or anybody else to decide that for you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks for being, <laughs> being very, very short and precise. Thank you. So the next point I would like to throw into Twella about the scope of this uh, inclusion, diversity and transparency, because when Ben is already saying, he's, he, he's, he's making a remark on that we need to be driver. We need, we need not to let each and every point or probably the, the expectation to be, to be driven by those, those ranking uh, uh, associations. So the thing is like the accreditation bodies, so we need to be we need to be driver. So for that, let's say, what do you think about the scope of this inclusion, diversity, and transparency, and how they can play uh, some uh, important role in in driving these accreditation systems, or probably how they are going to be measured, and so and so. So I will again request to be please be very very brief and short. Thank you. So Twala, you are you are muted. Oh, yes. thank you very much. Yes, please. Okay. I think for me, for effective quality assurance in universities, I think uh, it now means increasing the use of ICT in the education process and establishing a feedback mechanism with students. I'm just gonna summarize and assessing information resources. So that's for me, it's quite of like critical. So in order to provide, for example, an effective quality assurance, of course, digital transformation is a factor in the sense that uh, it's become more important uh, to use resources more efficiently, adapt to modern requirements, and also gain a strong advantage, advantage in the global competitive market. So once we get that right, then things will be sort of like will work. The transparency, the governance, the independence as well, uh, be, uh, we, we also, especially the independence, which always worries me because most of the time we, we're working in silos in universities, whereas each and every portfolio now plays a key role in terms of uh, an effective quality assurance and also in terms of driving the unit forward so that it can be highly kind of like recognized. So for me, it's, it's important, just effective and increase the use of ICT in, uh, in the education process. For me, that's, that's, that's the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks that we need to be effective and there should be a kind of collaboration and there should be a kind of transparency because each department and each function is important for, for building the quality, for building the high quality standards. So the last point probably I would like to discuss with Esra because then I would like to take maybe one or two questions as well. So how about this bias? Because at the at the beginning of the, of the note, so, so you mentioned about bias, so that come into accreditation maybe based on culture, resources, or geographies. So how do you think about this kind of bias? And if it is going to be a kind of role in this accreditation or, uh, or how we can make it probably more and more transparent or maybe more that and maybe we can, we can take care of this particular biasness or maybe unbiasedness as well. So please. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there can be some uh, precautions uh, that can be taken for uh, being uh, biased or uh, whatever. I mean, if a human being is involved, it's really uh, not uh, possible. It's not possible to have a neutral uh, type of uh, understanding of the situation. But the, the most important, the first criteria is uh, standardized criteria, which can be uniformly uh, somehow uh, applied all the institutions. The other one is uh, having diverse maybe uh, evaluation teams, having different backgrounds, uh, cultural backgrounds, experiences, uh, different perspectives, etc. The other one is the training uh, of the uh, evaluation teams, just to teach uh, maybe uh, the not only the uh, criteria, but also the peculiarities of some institutions, some countries, et cetera, et cetera. The other one is transparency, definitely, and proper feedback. And maybe uh, the most important thing is the review and uh, to take the opportunity of the institutions to contest evaluation outcomes. So these are, I think, 
uh, the main necessary elements that may uh, eliminate bias a little bit more. Thank you very so, much. Thank you very much. So I think uh, it is very difficult to remove bias or the biasness, but at least we can reduce it. We can manage, we can overcome it by keeping yeah. some measures. So now we have some questions from the audience. I will take probably three questions, one for, one for each. So the first question is for Ben. When we are talking about artificial intelligence, so probably because now it's all about open AI, we are talking about the application of this chat GPT or maybe other AI tools. So how we can see any path breaking uh, technology or maybe processes, those are emerging out soon and how these accreditation bodies or maybe these, uh, you could say ranking associations or probably the, uh, the governance. So they are taking care of all these moves. So is there any changes? Is there something happening or probably what are you looking for from your perspective? For, for some instructions to the institutions, to the leaders, or maybe to the to the institutions, please. I mean, everything is potentially changing, and and maybe not so much is changing. Um, there, there's been a, a popular meme going around um, that um, you're not going to be replaced by AI; you're going to be replaced by a person using AI. Um, and, I, and I think that's really the truth. You know, I mean, chat GPT and what it can do, we've all, we've all had a play around, I'm sure. And um, we've all read and seen some of the demonstrations of its capabilities. Um, and, you know, it does do some incredible things. Um, and it challenges almost every aspect of the educational process. How, how are you going to be able to tell the difference between an essay written by a student and an essay a student has asked chat GPT to write? And given the orientation towards future skills, which one deserves more credit? You know, so, I mean, if you're looking at it even in that context, then we're going to see it's affecting all sorts of things. Now, obviously, ChatGPT um, has drawn a bead on generative AI, uh, you know, one specific dimension of AI that we can all see and play with and touch and feel and be, and be amazed by. But the truth is that AI is creeping into all sorts of different dimensions. You know, one of the, um, one of the tools that we've built uh, using machine learning, for instance, helps a university um, understand the propensity of their applicants to actually go all the way through the process to enrollment. So for instance, for an Indian institution that receives 120,000 applications, how do I filter that through and focus on the best possible students that will actually enroll, that are less likely to have applied to a whole range of institutions that are ranked higher and more prestigiously than me alongside me, and therefore will likely drop out of the process if they're successful elsewhere. Well, AI and machine learning tools can, can manage volume very effectively. Um, they can you know, filter through hours of video content and find some of the highlights. They can, uh, they can um, look and identify what the, the right content is to meet a particular gap in a skills profile. Um, so I think we're going to see um, universities, employers, and individuals using AI-powered tools all the more. And the pressure on anybody over 35 is going to be to try and keep up with all the kids using these, these fancy tools to do, to do incredible things. Um, but ultimately, I think it comes back around. You know, if you've used chat GPT at all, what you realize pretty quickly is that it takes some skill and some capability in terms of how to ask it the right questions in order to get out meaningful answers. You don't turn up at that page and it, and it, and it reads your mind and immediately gives you what you want. You have to have a conversation. You have to learn how to talk to it. Uh, and therefore, that notion that um, it's people using these tools that are going to change the world, not the tools themselves, I think, uh, is a real opportunity for universities uh, because it's a new brand of upskilling that they've got to uh, that they've got to adapt to and build into their approaches. Oh, wonderful! I really like your thought. Like we are going to be replaced by by the tutor probably who is AI driven. It's not only a, it's not only like AI driven mechanism. No, no, wonderful, wonderful. And I think you're right. That's upskilling, and uh, it is going to be uh, giving an opportunity for the institution, for the leaders, and even for the students, like uh, so that they can they can excel probably in their in their future career. So wonderful. Thank you very much. The next 
question is for maybe Twela because he is more on that digital transformation. And again, because he's from Africa, so they are, the question is about in case of developing nations and also uh, probably uh, the question has been cited in terms of India as well. Like the quality or the creation, these cycles are, you could say, going on each and every year, or maybe sometimes several times in a year, or maybe after maybe after maybe a definite time period of time. But still, sometimes we can see there's a huge maybe kind of bureaucracy, corruption, or a kind of maybe uh, that kind of, uh, I don't know, manipulation, or that kind of, uh, you could say, just uh, doing some kind of unethical things or measures just to get those kind of accreditations. So, so how we are going to establish probably those kinds of checks or maybe those kinds of, uh, you could say, uh, maybe a kind of precautions or maybe kind of checks and balances or maybe kind of thoughts on that perspective, maybe for any of the developing economy. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, most in, the most important thing in this day and age is to automate our systems. The reason why there's a lot of bureaucracy is because most of the stuff we do, it's done manually. Um, it's always difficult to catch up. Uh, so for me, automation has become so critical that we need to start looking at automation, or automating our systems, even in relation to, to quality assurance and other aspects of things as well. But there's always a catch for developing countries, uh, uh, which include uh, IT infrastructure or lack of IT infrastructure, because if you talk of automation, you need a sound IT infrastructure. Uh, so that's where we're lacking as Africa. And also when you think of Africa as well, you, you in, in fact, even funding for some of these projects. I mean, we're talking of chat uh, GPT now, we're talking of um, systems uh, that we adaptive systems, but at the end of the day, they cost a lot of money. I mean, in Africa, we know that we, we have cut funding on critical things, whereas the developed countries, they are putting more money on this kind of things. That's why they're kind of like far much more advanced, but you can't blame Africa for that. I mean, it's uh, that's, it's it's the state of our economies. We're just battling. Uh, we can't, we have to take money somewhere and put it somewhere else where we feel that um, uh, in terms of priorities. So for me, it's very important that we need to start with our system have to be automated. Uh, it's either quality assurance, automate us, because you can figure out where the gaps are easily. And also you could be able to do things much more quick. But as it stands now, I'll give a good example. To have a program in South Africa up and running, let's say you want a BSc in big data analytics, it will take four years for it to be finalized. You ask yourself, why is that? Because you've done your proposals, you've done everything is in place but it's the bureaucracy, you see, because things are done kind of like manual. But then you need a shortcut to say, how can we overcome that? Then we have started to, to introduce short learning programs, which are not, I mean, they're, they're good, but not good enough as compared to a full kind of like program. You can have a small program on data analytics, a module and stuff like that, but it doesn't train the student well. It doesn't give them a much more extensive kind of like knowledge. But you need, you need to do something. You don't give up and say, oh, it's going to take four years. That's it. We're not going to uh, be part of this. So you need to, as I said, it's better to do something small and then grow than just giving up and say, oh, we don't have resources. We don't have the expertise and stuff like that, which is another thing that's costing us in Africa, the expertise part of things. Uh, we lack expect expertise in the critical kind of like uh, programs. For example, if you look at AI, if you look at um, digital transformation, if you look at programming, we, we're lacking. We don't have those expertise in Africa. I mean, compared to other, con other continents. So we need to start introducing that gradually and see how things take off as well. Thank you very much. No, no, no. So nice of you that, uh, and I really agree with you. Like uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy and the digital aspect the automation is very important if you are if you are looking to overcome such kind of bureaucracy or maybe those kind of manipulations or those kind of corruptions i don't know maybe uh, in that particular system so the last question of the day uh, from the audience side i will take it uh, for esra people are talking about like entrepreneurship within organization so intra 
entrepreneurship. You could say or maybe intrapreneurship. So how about this skill? Because most of the time, accreditation bodies or maybe those uh, you could say authorities or those systems they are not taking care of this entrepreneurship within organization. So as a teaching skill or probably as a teachable skill to students, so probably it is very important. But somehow it is not an important skill that to be considered within those accreditation systems. So would you like to put a remark on that, like that entrepreneurship within an organization and its relevance to that accreditation systems? Um, I think when we are talking about accreditation systems or bad benchmarking rankings, I mean, uh, we should just forget about its usefulness for the uh, institutions themselves. I mean, it's not something which is an uh, outside pressure, but it should, I mean, this desire has to come from inside the institutions. All the institutions and universities have their own strategies and everything. That's why while we're talking about all these issues, universities try to take uh, all the precautions for themselves, not directly for uh, just uh, uh, related with the requirements of the accreditation, whatever it is. So it's an insight, uh, uh, insight issue that uh, makes all these things uh, work together. So that's entrepreneurship, that's skills, students, everything uh, comes. I mean, uh, institutions themselves try to take uh, necessary precautions because students are the most important part of the education, right? I mean, but uh, so it's, it's so much uh, interrelated with each other. So institutions themselves take all the precautions, even if it's not a new requirement, requirement, whatever it is. But definitely, I mean, uh, institutions really like to have all the precautions, all the uh, necessary um, uh, requirements and try to get rid of all these issues. Thank you very much. So nice of you. Thank you very much. And finally, so we are at the end of the session and uh, I can see we have exceeded only 15 minutes, but I think I can, I can really say like uh, by virtue of three panelists, the great uh, panelist members who are sharing their thoughts. So I think we can keep continuing maybe for, for, for the, for the day period, for the remaining, for the remaining day period as well. So on this note, probably I would like to thank uh, Ben, Twala and Essa for sharing their valuable time, for sharing their thoughts and perspective on this valuable, on, on this very timely theme that when we are talking about accreditation, ranking and quality assurance. So quality assurance as probably I will like to summarize all the things, all the aspects that we have discussed in one or two minutes and then I will close. So like you have talked about like, or we are talking about this accreditation and ranking at the same time we are talking about quality. So I believe as an institution, the focus should be on quality. And as Ben has mentioned, so accreditation bodies, so they are expecting institution that they are going to drive themselves. Yeah, and then probably they need to be uh, the drivers and then accreditation bodies, probably they are going to be, the, to be the flower because they are ready to change, but they should have some criteria to change, to implement. So it is, it is something that to work on the other side of the table that as an institute, as a leadership, so probably we need to focus on students. We need to focus on the students' learning outcome, their engagement, employability, their interaction, and how we can improve their skills and how we can make them ready for the future. The second aspect could be for the faculty, maybe faculty support, engagement, what is their role and how the relationship between a faculty and a student can be established and how it can be improved and how, again, it can be, it can be tackled in such a way that if there is any challenge, of course, there is a challenge when we are talking about offline and online system, because today we are having in this uh, digital transformation when we are talking about again open AI and all those tools but still I think the mantra is like student faculty leadership governance so those are the key measures and whether it is offline or online system but still I think we can't escape from those valuable measures and of course there is a role of that transparency there is a role of that culture there is a role of those qualitative criteria there is a role of those quantitative criteria benchmark institutions we also discuss about younger and maybe the, the older institutions, but again, it again depends on the, on the level of adaptability, on the level of management and the drive that probably one institution is ready to go, whether it is maybe young university or a campus or maybe it is an older university or a campus. 
So uh, there should not be any resistance to change. If there is a resistance to change, then I think it is very difficult to adopt to these measures and to fill the criteria for those QS rankings. So maybe other accreditation bodies, which are very much looking forward to improve the overall quality and education systems in different parts of the world, across the world. So on this behalf, I would like to say, I would like to acknowledge a very huge and warm thanks and uh, my, uh, you could say, gratitude to, to all the three panel members. And I believe it was a highly valuable session. At least for me, it was it was very valuable because I have learned, I have, I have, I have listened, or probably I have, I have learned a couple of very important aspects. And of course, our audience, they must have learned or they must have been listening to you, your views. And those were very, very highly or maybe the precious moment for all of us. So probably in the future also, we would be taking care of your, of your services. And by the time being, uh, we are going to organize such a couple of events. Uh, so then again, we are going to contact you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. For your presence. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.